Nakapambahay lang ako. But nevertheless, uh, allow me to continue with the discussion of uh, Berkeley. And this time, by considering his rhetorical strategy. No? Uh, and let's uh, begin again with the preface where we ended last time. Let us now turn uh, to Berkeley's text. Uh, in the in the three dialogues between Philonous and Hylas, and see how his radically empiricist methodology leads to an idealist theory of knowledge, metaphysics, and philosophy of religion, uh, especially how they are combined to constitute a refutation of skepticism and atheism. The common philosophical error that leads to skepticism and atheism, Berkeley believes, is an ultimately unintelligible commitment to the existence of mind-independent substance or matter as the underlying substratum of sensible things and the sensible properties we experience in sense perception. So the fact that we believe that something can exist apart from our mind that's where the problem is, says Berkeley. Berkeley's three dialogues between Hylas and Philonous emphasizes the contrast between materialism and idealism even in the title. The name Hylas, which is, with its classical connotations, is chosen by Berkeley not only for literary effect but as representing materialism. As we remarked in discussing Aristotle's theory of substance, or maybe in your understanding of Aristotle's understanding of substance, the ancient Greek word hyle means matter, which Aristotle incorporates in his account of prote hyle or prime matter. Hylas, an imaginary composite character in Berkeley's dialogue, is a materialist, a thinker who, at the outset of the book, accepts the existence of mind-independent matter. Exactly what these beliefs amount to, we shall have to come more gradually to understand as the arguments on both sides of the dispute unfold. Scholars have conjectured that Hylas, among other thinkers, represent the materialist metaphysics of Locke and even Malibrache. Philonous, on the other hand, is an eloquent spokesman for Berkeley's idealism and anti-materialism, and ultimately for Berkeley's empiricism. The name Philonous is equally significant for Berkeley in its language roots or etymology. The name combines the Greek words philo and nous. The word philo means love of. We find it in the word philosophy, where together with the word sophia, it means love of wisdom. Combined here with nous, meaning mind, the name Philonous refers to the love of the mind. It is a perfect designation for the Berkeleyan idealist stringently opposed to materialism in Berkeley's dialogue. The fact that Berkeley chooses to express his theory in the form of a dialogue is also noteworthy. Berkeley, whose who wrote a previous philosophical book, A Treatise on the Principles of Human Knowledge, which is the text prior to this uh, text. No, uh, Here, this, this text is the principles. Um, at the age of 25, arguing that sensible things or physical objects are conjuries of ideas in the mind rather than material entities existing external to all thought. So we see that initial idea as early as the principles of human knowledge. The theory he presented there was greeted with incomprehension, misunderstanding, and even ridicule. Berkeley accordingly resolved to present his view again in a different format 
that he hoped would receive a friendlier reception by philosophical critics and the general educated reading public. The dialogue format, as we know from Plato's example, tracing dialectical twists and turns in trying to arrive at the truth about the philosophical concept or to resolve a philosophical problem, especially suited also to Berkeley's purposes. Berkeley, in fact, in the three dialogues, uh, find this specifically suited to his purposes. Let's look at the preface here. He reports, again, in the preface, these words. He says, this design I propose in the first part of a treatise concerning the principles of human knowledge published in the year 1710. But before I proceed to publish the second part, I thought it requisite to treat more clearly and fully of certain principles laid down in the first and to place them in a new light, which is the business of the following dialogues. The advantage Berkeley sees in the use of dialogue is primarily rhetorical. The dialogue communicates the principles of his idealist philosophy in the give and take between Hylas and Philonous. There is an opportunity in following their exchange for the reader to examine objections to Berkeley's position that might also occur to an unsympathetic critic represented by the person of Hylas and more importantly, in the criticisms to be answered and refuted by Philonous. There is also a theatrical effect that Berkeley expects to achieve in the drama portrayed as Hylas initially expresses disagreement with Philonous, but being reasonable and open-minded as Berkeley expects an intelligent reader to be, Hylas progressively accepts first some of Philonous' main contentions, retrenches, and tries in various ways to reassert materialism as against idealism, and is finally, if reluctantly, convinced. Berkeley hopes... Uh, that the gentle reader who might at first be unpersuaded or even hostile to idealism, like so many of those who objected to or simply could not understand his principles, will also gradually come around to accepting his anti-materialism. By identifying with Hylas, critics may find that they cannot do any better in trying to support his objections to Philonous. And in the end, will be won over to Berkeley's philosophy despite their original positions. Philonous challenges Hylas at a critical juncture in their exchange in this spirit when, when Philonous has answered Hylas' criticism, but Hylas was uh, not very happy to accept defeat. We can see this one at the end, for example, of the first dialogue. Uh, near the end of the first dialogue. And let's check that out. Here. I would fain know what more you would require in order to a perfect conviction. Have you not had the liberty of explaining yourself all manner of ways? Were any little slips in discourse laid hold and insisted on? Or were you not allowed to retract or reinforce anything you had offered as best served your purpose? Had not everything you could say been heard and examined with all the fairness imaginable? In a word, have you not in every point been convinced out of your own mouth? And if you can at present discover any flaw in any of your former concessions or think of any remaining subterfuge, any, would, any new distinction, color, or comment whatsoever, why do you not produce it? 
if Berkeley had not has not done his work well, then at the end of the dialogue, even a reader predisposed to disagree with Berkeley's conclusions should be in no stronger position, philosophical position than Hylas to object to Berkeley's radical empiricism and idealism and idealism it entails. In exasperation at his inability to refute Philonous, Berkeley expects to give his theory a new life by presenting it in this argumentatively more effective version to win more argue advocates for a position that he thinks is necessary in order to maintain the highly interwoven connection between science and religion and between the refutation of skepticism and atheism and to demonstrate in a different way than Descartes the dependence of all knowledge and the existence and nature of the sensible world of the existence of God. Uh, it's very important to consider that, no? um, that understanding, um, as it will play a very important role um, in comprehending uh, the stand of Berkeley. We'll end it here and uh, please click next uh, if you've understood. If not, please try to listen again to the text and read the primary text. Thank you.